All right, good afternoon, everyone. And for anyone joining us for their first session of the day, welcome to the Rockefeller Institute of Government's Local Government Lab. And for everyone returning after lunch, welcome back. Uh, my name is Lee Wedenoya. I'm an economist and senior policy analyst here at the Rockefeller Institute. And I am absolutely delighted to be moderating the second education panel of the day, Collaboration and Partnerships in Education, Part Two, Building Pipelines. The presentations in this panel both focus on building career pathways for a high quality and diverse workforce in the public sector, which has become particularly timely given the contraction of the public workforce over the past two years. Because there are only two presentations, I'm gonna give each presenter 20 to 25 minutes to get a little bit more in depth for everyone, and then have a 10 to 20 minute Q&A at the end of the second presentation. I encourage the audience, however, to use the Q&A box at any time during the presentation so that the questions are queued up and ready to go at the end and so you don't forget what you were planning to ask. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Michelle Kincaid, Senior Associate at the Maxwell X Lab, part of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University with her presentation, Maxwell X Lab, Applied Research in Central New York. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, thank you, Lee, for a super introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here again. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about some of the work that the X Lab is doing in Central New York. So uh, this is the brief agenda that I'll be going over today. I'll start with just an overview of what the Maxwell X Lab is and what we do. Um, the bulk of my presentation will be about the Baldanza Fellowship Program and our intervention there. And then uh, since I have some extended time today, I will do a short um, overview of a project we're doing with the city of Syracuse involving some machine learning techniques. So what is the X Lab? It was started in 2017. It's a field experiment lab housed in Maxwell School at Syracuse University specifically within the Center for Policy Research. Uh, our mission is to build evidence for what works and to do good in the Syracuse community and beyond. Um, we use behavioral science to create targeted interventions and evaluate them, often using randomized controlled trials uh, to confidently measure those outcomes from the intervention. But we also do lots of other techniques. We do a lot of survey experiments, um, natural experience, lots of different things. Um, so, but today I'll be talking about an RCT. So how do we do this? Um, like I said, we partner with nonprofit organizations and often local and state government agencies. We work with them to identify a program or a policy that they would like to improve or test with an intervention. And in this work, we also collaborate with uh, many scholars from the Maxwell School whose research interests often align with these types of projects. Um, so that's often with tax policy, anti-poverty programs, um, health and um, food uh, insurance, food benefit programs. Um, but today, I'm really excited to talk about a partnership that's actually across colleges um, within the university, within our colleagues in the School of Education. Um, and this is a picture of Syracuse City Hall. So today, uh, I'll be discussing our work with a brand new program called the Baldanza Fellowship Program. And like I said, this is a partnership between the School of Ed, Maxwell, uh, CNY, and CNY school districts. And so this is um, new. Uh, we're the first recruitment cycle has been this year. This new class will start this fall, I believe. And this is uh, funded by a generous gift from the Baldanza family. So that's the, the namesake. Um, and the program is dedicated to recruiting, developing, and retaining diverse and underrepresented teachers into the Syracuse area K through 12 schools. Um, and you know, the scope of this is that um, there's a you know, racial and student um, teacher diversity gap in the, the area. In 2017, the Education Trust in New York um, found that while nearly half of the city um, Syracuse City School Districts, um, the students are Black, only 5% of the district's teachers represent uh, are, are Black as well, and so this is just one, um, we, the, we know a little bit about the scope of the, the situation there, and this is 
trying to address some of that. So um, this is a 16 month master's program in the School of Ed. There are some particular programs that um, are that students would apply to, um, but it's a, a quick program that the cohort will pr receive professional development training as well as mentorship. There's a tuition scholarship, a $5,000 stipend for living expenses. And um, most importantly, I think, is that um, upon you know, successful completion of the program and fit with the school district, the uh, student will get a hiring commitment from the partner school district and um, agrees to work in that school for um, a, number of uh, a number of years, I believe it's three years. Um, so that's some details on the program itself. Um, this is a picture of the website as it is today. So um, I wanted to give a sense uh, of, give you all a sense of the project team. Like I said, this is um, really neat in that it's a collaboration, um, not even within Neil Maxwell, it's across um, different school and the School of Ed. And so um, our School of Ed colleagues are uh, Christy Ashby, George Theo Harris, and Sponza Milgore. And um, they are doing you know, a lot of the really important work um, coordinating with the school districts. Um, rec recruiting them, assessing their needs, making sure um, we're you know, providing the right things um, for their needs, as well as organizing the fellowship itself. Whoops. Um, and so that's the School of Ed side. And then we are um, the evaluation team. And that's uh, led by Len Lobo, who is one of the founders and uh, the current director of the Maxwell X Lab. He's also a professor in the BAI. PAIA department in Maxwell, as well as Bob I. Folko. And then Hannah Patnayak is the managing director of the lab. And then myself, we are all um, working on the evaluation. So um, a really great team. We've been um, really excited to get to meet some new people and do some really cool work together. So this is a multi-year project, as I mentioned. Um, the bolded uh, questions at the top are the things that I'll be addressing in the next few slides. Um, and those first two questions are about recruitment. So, you know, how do we recruit and retain qualified applicants to the program? And how can we leverage what we know in behavioral science and public administration to test what messages and framing may be most effective? Um, the second two questions are about some longer term outcomes. Um, those will come later, maybe next year I'll talk about that, but, um, you know, we're interested in knowing what exactly the impact of teachers recruited through the program have on the district and student outcomes. And then what impact does the program have on the likelihood of entering and remaining in teaching? So, um, our intervention is essentially a targeted multi-stage email campaign. And we're interested in uh, if testing message and or medium uh, or mode of, um, of the message that impacts application rates. And we know from behavioral science that um, testing framing effects could be um, really important. We know that small changes in how opportunities are presented can impact who engages and when. And so um, here I've posted some, some images from a study that really uh, influenced a lot of our thinking about this particular situation. And that was a uh, paper by Elizabeth Linos from UC Berkeley and also the Behavioral Insights team. And they did a really interesting experiment in which they tested or they hypothesized, you know, that job ads for public service positions. Um, and in this particular situation, it was police officers. Um, the messaging that focused on serving the community alone would not be as effective as, as other um, options. And so they tested how um, people of color and women, um, how their applications, uh, you know, their, if they would apply um, based on messages that instead emphasize challenges of the job or career benefits. Um, and the salience of both of those things, really emphasizing sort of the personal benefits that one would get from a job in public service. Um, and they found that emphasizing these benefits were three times as effective as a control and that they were particularly effective for the applicants of color and women. And so we drew a lot of inspiration from this project. Um, they sent out postcards. So uh, the images here on the bottom, um, there was a series of postcards and messages 
but this one, um, you know, are you up for the challenge? Um, and on the back was some additional messaging. And so um, that served as um, a really important element to designing our intervention. So in our project, we are doing an RCT as um, the Elizabeth Minos paper did as well. And um, we're interested in testing these um, you know, variations in messaging. We coordinated with partner organizations and offices who work with the target population to generate our sample. And we randomly assigned individuals in the sample to five experimental conditions. So the first is a control group. Um, they received none of the messages, but they could be potentially exposed to the School of Education's recruitment efforts that are going on um, simultaneously, just completely separate from our own. Um, so group two and three receive a career oriented message. It's, are you looking for a long-term career or looking for a long-term career? Um, group two is getting a letter um, sort of designed email and group three is getting a flyer, but essentially the message is the same. Um, but then group four and five, uh, they're getting sort of that challenge message like the postcard I just showed in the previous experiment. And so they're gonna see something that says, are you, just, are you up for the challenge of teaching? Um, they'll get it in a letter form and then group five says, you know, are you up for the challenge? Um, and they'll get that in the flyer version. Oops, goodness. Okay, so um, depending on your screen, I know that the text could be a little bit small, but really this is just to show the, the visual differences um, and some of the important treatment elements. So for the letter, um, this is on the left. This design is meant to emulate like a formal invitation, something that you might receive um, you know, in an envelope in the mail. Um, it has very few images. It has the heritage logo. Um, for St. Cunard's University that's um, really reserved for um, formal communications versus the design on the right, which is the flyer. And this has, um, you know, the more, the more modern branding, um, lots of color blocking, lots of color, um, the color image. And so this is meant to be um, more informative and just test, you know, what, if, if design really has any impact on how information is um, taken up for this program. And um, importantly, all of the colors, fonts, um, and, and things like that are brand compliant <laughs> with the university, which is um, which is really important for the intervention because you know, establishing legitimacy um, and, and ensuring that the recipients know um, or see this and it's in line with any other sort of communications they're getting from the university and make sure that they're, you know, it's real. Um, <laughs> um, so highlighted are, you know, the important elements. Um, at the top is personalization, like the Lena study, and really like all of the interventions that we do in the lab that involve correspondence with um, a participant. We really emphasize including um, their first name or a name, the, um, their name, so that's personalized to them. Um, the first paragraph is, um, you know, just information introducing the program itself, um, explaining that they uh, could help address, you know, this critical need, and then both have the treatment message. Um, you'll see the treatment message in the flyer. It does cut off the, the word teaching, um, and this is just a design sort of compromise, um, but still the main message is there, and they're both in the same um, flow of the document. And then the third element is the fellowship benefits. And this was an important choice because um, you, know, you could imagine we could have put um, like information about the eligibility, um, but again, sort of in line of emphasizing the personal benefit um, of the Lino study, we chose to put you know, what an applicant could get or if they were to apply and then be accepted and what this would mean for them. And then at the end, we have a call to action for them to, to apply. And then embedded, there's also um, a link that says click here for more information. And um, that was another element that we're tracking to see if people um, did seek out more information. 
So this slide is a timeline. Um, as I said, this is multi um, stage. And so we've sent out a few emails and it all started back in November of last year. The first email was um, the one that I had just shown. It's an outreach email, essentially testing those different um, messages and the different modes. This was sent um, strategically before Thanksgiving break because um, just based on like our intuition and um, knowing that a lot of our sample um, were might have still been in school um, and uh, and could be affected by you know the break, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, this would get received before then. And so this is the the SU Thanksgiving break too. So we're slightly biased in that sense, but still. We want to get it out as soon as possible in that regard um, after getting all of our um, IRB things in check. So that was sent the 18th. And then we um, always intended to send a reminder email that was closer to the deadline um, to really increase the salience of, the, of that date. Um, so we sent that on January 3rd. And that was essentially the same email, except we added um, a banner uh, on the flyer that said that the deadline was extended. And then on the letter, we had some additional language, um, actually had it sort of sent from Speranza, who was the recruitment um, person. So similar, to, similar. Um, if we're hoping to get the similar sort of effect, but still acknowledging the context of the two different designs. So that was January 3rd. Um, and then we actually sent out a third email um, a few weeks ago because the application was, uh, the deadline was extended to March 25th. So um, in order to get a few more applicants. And so because of this, um, we decided to actually re-randomize the group um, and include uh, the, the control group as well and test out um, if novelty would have any effect on uh, getting people to apply. Um, and that was uh, really cool because we're, we're gonna see, you know, if um, it's interesting to see, you know, the control, how that might work. Um, they would be the high novelty group. You know, they haven't received any information about this um, to our knowledge versus, you know, very low novelty, um, which would be the group. Um, the numbers are, uh, I can't remember the numbers, but uh, the group, you know, that had the, the letter the entire time. So this would be the third letter email. So that's still um, pending, but that's um, that was the third email that was delivered a few weeks ago. And so on the 25th, um, we will know more, but that is, that's the timeline for this first recruitment cycle. So outcomes, you know, what are we really interested in seeing here? Um, the, the main, the top three, you know, admitted, uh, were interested in if they applied. Um, did they apply not only to the Beldanza Fellowship application, but also the SU graduate school application? That, um, that was something that was a little bit complicated, um, but an important, you know, distinction that they actually have to apply to both things. And then were they admitted to the program? Um, did they matriculate? And then regarding the, the, the messages themselves, you know, we're looking at open, um, open rates. Um, do they open any of them? And we sent a few. And then do they click on anything? And really, this is just trying to understand, did the information move them to the application website where they would get more information and ultimately help um, make the decision to apply or not? So, this is still in the field, um, as you saw in the timeline. And um, so there's lots to still learn. However, we do know a few things. Um, early insights have shown us that, uh, early data has shown us that the letter is a bit more effective with regard to opens and clicks. Um, we know that the message had very little effect that we can tell so far. So the challenge and the, um, the career didn't seem to have any difference in um, outcomes there. Um, you know, testing the novelty effect will be interesting. Still have to see what that does once we get the final data. Um, but overall, I think 
that we all are very cognizant that this is, um, you know, I don't think, we, I think it would be strange as, um, if we saw like a very large effect because this is, um, you know, one email <laughs> or a few emails um, that people get, you know, uh, amongst many you now that we all know we get lots of email, you know, campaigns like this. So um, we just know that this is really helpful for this project. Um, this is very distinct from the recruitment efforts that the School of Ed has done before and sort of the business as usual. And so really this is getting a lot of information for the group, um, getting great baseline figures to know how we can iterate and really help diagnose what to do for the next generations. So um, to close, uh, we do have some other things going on as well with local government. Um, we are going to work with the city of Syracuse on um, with their property assessment team and doing some machine learning. So this um, this is really cool, uh, fun, um, you know, method to do. And the city of Syracuse is a great partner. And so, really, what we're interested in understanding is if machine learning, uh, if a you know, well designed algorithm could accurately predict residential property values. Um, this is really important to this department. Um, it's a it's a kind of complicated process and um, you know evolving. And um, if there was an algorithm that could process the data um, in a you know efficient but also you know ethical manner, um, this would be really valuable to them. They've been doing some work with uh, machine learning, and so we're working with them to to continue refining that. Um, and this is uh, yeah. So that's that's in the works. Um, okay, so that's all I have for today. Um, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. As someone who's worked on reforms in the teacher hiring process, we often find very small results in part because there isn't that huge of a pool of qualified teachers to hire from in the first place. So I look forward to see if uh, if there's an effect on recruitment for teaching programs, that would be really, really amazing. Um, so as a reminder to the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A function at any time and stick around after our next presentation for the Q&A. Uh, so now I'd like to welcome Corey Zoli, Director of Sponsored Research and Development for the International Studies Association and Senior Research Scholar in Global Affairs and International Security at the University of Connecticut and Michael Marciano, research, Associ research associate professor and associate director for research in the College of Arts and Sciences Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute at Syracuse University. Um, and their presentation on what a difference a year makes collaboration for diversifying the pipeline for US federal intelligence jobs. So we're still in the public sector, but a very different part. Thank you, Lee. It's uh, really great, actually, to be back at the, the Rockefeller Government Lab. Um, I was here uh, March 2020. I think that was actually my last in-person presentation before all of the sort of COVID experiences that we all went through hit. So, um, so Rockefeller has a special place in my heart. <laughs> um, Mike Marciano is here with me today. Thank you for those introductions. Um, so I thought what we would do is I'll share my screen so folks can see our, um, our slide deck here. Can everybody see that okay? Good. Um, so I thought what I would do is give a little bit of an introduction and overview um, of our program that we're talking about. And you're, you're right, Lee, it is exactly at the intersection of education, higher education in our case. And the federal government, it has some state and local government implications as well, but we're looking at a very particular sector and that is the national security intelligence sector. But um, there's also some really interesting overlaps actually with um, Michelle Kincaid's um, presentation as well, in the sense that we also are doing um, recruitment and we're recruiting for the purpose of diversifying the federal um, jobs and career sector um, pipeline. 
So uh, five items for our discussion today. One is just to describe this intelligence center, um, intelligence community center for academic excellence at Syracuse University with its four um, consortia partner schools. We call it the ICCAE, just the acronym. Um, our discussion also will be on number two, how we broaden the concept of diversity and why that was particularly appropriate for Syracuse University, for this intelligence community program itself, and also for our, our partner institutions, which had really interesting contributions to diversity, like first generation students, um, new immigrant students, rural students, et cetera. We'll talk third, uh, thirdly, and Mike will will do largely this portion about the challenges of incorporating um, STEM students into the ICCAE program, even though we have some really just fabulous programs at Syracuse and elsewhere in the STEM fields. Um, the forensics program is, is uh, my part home and, and Mike's home um, at SU. Uh, Grove School of Engineering in, in the CUNY system is one of our partners in New York. Um, and lastly, we'll address questions of using some academic norms of collaboration and data-driven research to really increase our diversity outcomes. And we were pretty focused on outcomes. Um, and that's been both a challenge, but also a nice uh, compass, a nice organizing compass for this particular work. Okay, so just a quick overview of what exactly this Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence program is. Um, these programs are federally um, funded and congressionally mandated. So basically the, the um, IC community, the intelligence community through um, Congress's role uh, created these um, higher education recruitment programs. They began in 2005. They sit currently, they've had a kind of interesting pedigree, but they sit currently at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI. And there are over 90 programs currently funded um, in the US. Uh, Syracuse University's program with its partner institutions began in 2019. So we're in year three of the program. Um, they are designed with some pretty specific goals. And that is to try to recruit culturally, ethnically, um, and disciplinarily diverse students for the purposes of working in the national security sector and specifically the 18 uh, agencies of the intelligence community. Now, um, I put the uh, I put the the various intelligence agencies up there on the screen so you could actually see them. And we used to always say 17, and there are 18 now because of the addition of of Space Force, but I won't go through them all because it would take too long, all of our time. But I will say that basically the way that the intelligence community is divided up is in terms of the, the military units. So you've got Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, and now Space Force intelligence um, elements. Then you have DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. And then you have some of the agencies that I think are more familiar to most folks, like CIA, FBI, Department of Homeland Security. But maybe not so well known are the fact that the Department of State and the Department of Treasury, um, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office, those are all part of the 18 agencies or elements of the IC. And we, we often make this point to our students at SU and at our consortia institutions um, because lots of folks think of the IC as just the CIA. Um, and that may have, you know, essentially some pejorative or negative implications for folks. I mean, some people think it's great, but it, but it has some um, sort of, you know, very, very um, definitive or intense associations. What many of our students don't think about is going into nuclear security at the Department of Energy or going into you know, a language or linguistic role at the State Department. So we try to be very um, uh, emphatic about the really the diversity of roles one can take um, if they're interested in at the undergraduate level or at the graduate level in, in going into this ICCAE program to be recruited into the um, intelligence agencies. Um, 
I think I mentioned there are 90 participating uh, campuses um, historically since 2005 participating in these ICCAE programs. And if you just take a look very briefly, and I won't go into a lot of detail here unless there are questions, but essentially the federal government has been involved in these diversity and inclusion uh, recruitment programs for some time. Um, the idea of diversifying the pipeline is essentially about um, strategic human capital management. There remains a pretty significant skills gap within the federal workforce, which I've sort of tried to depict with that, that chart. Um, and this kind of persists despite the best efforts of you know, OMD or OPM, so the Office of Personnel Management. And um, on the IC side in particular, the reason that this strategic human capital workforce management strategy is so important um, is because the IC is really trying to use personnel that reflect the diversity of the nation. So the idea here is that you can have more um, successful, more targeted, more customized, more um, inclusive um, intelligence um, results if you can actually reflect the diversity of the nation and your, your personnel. Um, the program itself has many elements. And again, I could spend most of my time talking about those, but I'm just gonna give you sort of a, a, the, the main pillars and an overview. So um, the idea, and I think what made Syracuse somewhat unique in, um, in becoming part of the Centers for um, Excellence in the IC, um, that there's a kind of ethics and rule of law emphasis in our offering uh, that was, I think, distinctive from other universities. And the idea here is that the rule of law and legal and ethical obligations are an enormous part of the national security ethos. And that that approach to public service is what distinguishes um, our program, but also the IC community in general. There's a very high level of you know, ethical and uh, uh, law-based norms as part of one's commitment when they work in the IC. And that includes everything from um, integrity concerns, character concerns, um, and we can talk in more detail about these. So I think in the way that we were linking our program to those kinds of ethical and normative questions that really stood out to the ODI and to the intelligence community, um, the various agencies in general. So the program itself involves uh, a curricular development piece where we're building new courses. Um, the PI for the program, um, former Vice Admiral um, Bob Moret, Robert Moret, has created some defense intelligence courses. Um, I've created a course on national security law and policy. Others have created courses, and we also had really strong courses across the various units, the various schools at Syracuse University to begin with. Our consortia partners of John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice, Wells College, which is a rural school, um, a rural serving school here in central New York, um, Norfolk State University, which is an HBCU, and um, Grove College uh, of Engineering, part of the CUNY system. They've all worked to, in some ways, create programs or curriculum that are, are building out this, um, this interest in national security intelligence um, matters. Um, and in that sense, we've together collaboratively done some curriculum development. We're in the process right now of working on a minor. There are also scholarships. We have a Downey scholarship as part of the student recruitment offerings across the consortia partner schools. There's a professional national security and intelligence community interface where students do, um, they kind of embed in internship programs um, and a summer seminar with the intelligence community. Unfortunately, for the last couple of years, we've been doing this virtually, but we'll be shifting over soon to people actually visiting with and going into the various um, agencies in DC. And then there's a faculty research and professional development piece where we've tried to kind of open the door to interdisciplinary faculty about what this program is about and um, how we might have a better understanding of what the intelligence community actually does um, in the world through this program. 
Um, just two other points I want to make before I hand it over to Mike, and that is um, we've used a very, as you can see in my discussion, we've used a very broad conception of security in um, building out and designing this program. And it's inclusive of both the, the national security institutions, um, you know, the NSA, the National Security Agency, as well as the intelligence community um, elements, like I mentioned, the 18. Um, but it also is designed to encompass the traditional national security pr priorities that we're all sort of familiar with, like governance, military issues, conflict, rule of law issues, but also new global security challenges. And that includes human security issues, food security, for instance, economic security, new technologies, community resilience, um, even uh, the ways in which um, you know, cyber warfare and other issues are coming across the, the prioritized list of threats. So the idea here is to, to try to broaden our notion of security. So it's everything from human security to the traditional challenges of, of military issues and war, and to show how those issues are interdependent and how security implicates many aspects of public service and public life. Um, our, as I mentioned before, our notion of diversity itself is quite broad. We tried to uh, leverage Syracuse University's own strengths in this area. We have a long history of, of prioritizing military veterans, as well as um, students who have physical um, disabilities. So we have a disability emphasis as well as a veterans emphasis. But our sort of six categories of diversity um, were women who are interested in public service, governance, security, and intelligence. Uh, historically, women have been marginalized in the more male-dominated national security field. So we tried to uh, prioritize that. We prioritized historically underrepresented students by ethnic and racially um, racial backgrounds. Uh, and that included everything from first generation students, students who were um, you know, often new immigrants, um, students of color. So that's a broad understanding of ethnic and racial diversity. Three, there were culturally and religiously diverse students and this became really important, especially with language skills. Four students who are from rural backgrounds and under-resourced socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, five uh, military and veteran students, as I mentioned. Uh, we have a high population and a long commitment to veteran students at SU and students of all abilities, including those with um, particular physical um, disabilities. So I'm gonna hand the, the um, floor over to Mike and I'm willing to take questions at the end on any of these issues. Thanks, Corey, and thank you to the Rockefeller Institute for having us. I am also going to share my screen. <clears throat> so as a part of the ICCAE at Syracuse, the Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute, uh, it's a mouthful, uh, has uh, certainly played a significant role uh, because of the use of forensics and investigative science in uh, the intelligence community and uh, obviously a significant player in national security issues. So if I had a dollar for every time that a student came up to me and said, my goal is to be in the FBI, I would be very wealthy. And one of our jobs is to encourage students to broaden their view of where forensics and STEM is applicable in the federal government, where all of the intelligence elements that Corey had mentioned earlier uh, have STEM related uh, departments or uh, subdisciplines uh, within their uh, office. So the forensics uh, department at Syracuse University uh, collaborates greatly with not only federal agencies, but also local criminal forensic laboratories and corporate relationships. And this is a very important uh, facet of the forensics uh, program. And that is because when you combine the stakeholders in every aspect of the problem set, the users, the developers, and the industrial partners, you get a much more complete or well-rounded solution. Uh, and so we have engaged these groups 
to make sure we understand the problem. We understand what is possible. And during this process, we involve students at every step along the way. So not only do these students get uh, the exposure to the problem set, but they also get to network within. So the culture of scientific innovation uh, really relies on academia as a way to move ideas forward. And as opposed to a lot of uh, hypothesis-driven research, we focus more on the applied or the um, uh, problem-solving aspects of the uh, research. We want to be given a problem and asked to solve it. And so this has an intersection where basic science, just the justice system, and national security all meet. And this is where we believe the high impact and successful research will happen. Now, applied sciences rely on academia. Academia has inherently more innovation, less evolution. And this is where we experience that diversity of ideas and solutions where, you know, I can walk down the hallway and talk to a chemist. I'm a biologist myself, but I could walk down and talk to a chemist or uh, talk to an expert in uh, national security policy to see how some uh, various solutions fit into the greater uh, picture. So the key here really is technology transition. How can we get research that is developed in academia transitioned over to the user? And this is a very challenging aspect of the pipeline. And what really needs to happen is there needs to be a culture of scientific innovation. It needs to be supported at various points in the pipeline, starting in academia, but also on the government side, knowing when to reach out to academia. Uh, there have been many programs that have been set up, one being this ICCAE program, which has been uh, around for, for a good amount of time, but also the individual intelligence elements have started increasing their outreach to uh, universities. So the leaky pipeline, this is a, a phrase that uh, I did not develop, but if we look at this leaky pipeline in STEM, how can we get students involved in uh, STEM and how can we retain them? So uh, in your K through 12 education, we look to expose, engage, and engage and develop that career path in STEM. And this could be through formal activities uh, such as uh, curriculum or informal activities, clubs, uh, and things like that. Uh, your collegiate career, undergrad and grad, you're focusing on education, training, and gaining that experience. Uh, the experiential part here is very critical because that gives these students a, uh, an outlet, understand why and how more than just le learning textbooks. And then the career, we have professional development, retention can be an issue, particularly in the IC and forensics uh, and how to promote. And so these leaks in the pipeline. We have individuals leaving STEM for other paths. And the complicating factors in the forensics and IC areas is that one background is important and not in terms of diversity, but actually in terms of having a, a clean background without uh, any kind of uh, criminal uh, background um, as re related to other things as well, certainly. There's also a high degree of scrutiny uh, from the public, whether that's the, the legal system, the media, um, partisan politics, uh, pay is also not going to be as good as industrial uh, opportunities, although we always uh, sell students on the pensions. So how do we stop the leak and how do we uh, increase diversity and competition with industries that pay better? Uh, essentially. <clears throat> so how can we increase diversity? Well, primary resources. We've found that there's been a lot of success with interviews, open houses, tours, 
actively engaging students on a one-on-one -on -one or group in person, uh, hopefully, but we have also seen this effective in Zoom uh, or remote um, platforms. Applied or experiential learning early. So in K through 12 or early undergrad, what we learn and the curriculum that I was exposed to uh, in elementary and high school, et cetera, was we learned the basics, right? How, how do you take a derivative of, of an equation? But we were never introduced to why and what it affects. So maybe include that problem set definition, how to interpret, how to translate that into the uh, curriculum. So you understand why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, provide seed funding. So the ICCAE uh, at Syracuse University, we've developed a mini grant or fellowship program that also helps fund uh, research to try to increase uh, the participation in this program. And another big uh, item is walking through common misconceptions about the intelligence community or about serving in law enforcement. Uh, one very unique aspect of this uh, area uh, in forensics and the intelligence community is that scientific integrity plays a very, very important role, integrity in general, uh, and in particular in these service-driven applied sciences. So there's a fact that science commonly underlies criminal justice and national security decisions. And there are key issues that need to be addressed, such as is the science valid? Does it work? How does it work? What are the limits? This is called validation. Uh, communication, something that is extremely important, both in a criminal setting or an intelligence community setting, where you might have uh, highly uh, specialized scientific uh, knowledge that's being passed from an expert to policymakers that need to understand the content without a lot of the details that underlie the science. So we need to communicate that in a responsible manner. And then of course the scientists themselves has to have a uh, clean background, uh, has to be uh, shown to be uh, of high character, trustworthy, honest, uh, have uh, good academics and a diverse uh, experience. So in this case, scrutiny is of both a friend and a foe uh, because it really does help improve the fields, both in the IC and in forensics in general, because we have a greater attention to detail. However, uh, and this talks to the retention standpoint, it can cause a lot of stress with low upside. So it's a thankless job in many cases. And unfortunately, the scrutiny can encourage fraud in some cases. Now, it's rare, certainly, but with a high stress job with this uh, um, low upside, you can end up protecting yourself and making bad decisions in that way. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Corey uh, for questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Lee because I, I think it's, it's, your, uh, it's your call now, Lee, for helping us moderate questions. Great. Um, I'd love to bring back all of our panelists, um, including Michelle, so we can get into some questions. There are questions in the hopper, but I'm the moderator, so I get to ask the first question because I feel like it. Um, so I'm going to ask all of you to elaborate a little bit more on this dynamic process of collaboration between researchers and stakeholders when it comes to you know, developing these recruitment and career pathways, you know, specifically this process of identifying a need, designing and implementing an intervention or a plan to address that need, evaluation, changes, reevaluation, et cetera. And how has that worked in sort of these projects and other ones you've done? And what advice do you have for both researchers and practitioners who want to get into this space? And you know, collaborate more between each other? Where, where do they start? Who do they talk to? Whoever wants to start first is, is welcome to. I could start from my experience. And so the, the, the key 
uh, area of importance. There's two. One is you have to have a problem that is of interest. Uh, you can't collaborate just to collaborate, right? There has to be a reason for that collaboration. Uh, the second, uh, I would say, most important aspect of this is communication. You have to make sure you're communicating with the right people, uh, understanding the problem, and having uh, open um, lines of dialogue about that problem, which in some cases in the IC and forensic, where you have national security and um, legal um, issues, uh, can be challenging to understand the real problem right? Uh, trust, again, is very important too. And lastly, I would say managing expectations. So making sure everyone knows what their roles are uh, and when their, their perspectives are going to be needed. We like to make sure that we have uh, clear, open communication of, all along the collaboration with the stakeholders, the students when possible, uh, and the researchers. Um, yeah, I'd say that a lot of what, um, what Michael said resonates a lot with um, our process and that, um, well, in addition, I think in this particular project with the Baldanza Fellowship, um, with regard to like starting a, a partnership, um, particularly in, I think, our case, a new one, um, I think that leadership is really important within our larger organization. Um, you know, I know that like our deans were really instrumental in helping um, coordinate, you know, this process and um, knowing where the expertise lies and um, helping our group, you know, get together to do this project. So that was really important. And since then, um, yeah, a lot of um, open communication. Um, we have lots of project meetings because in this project, there's a lot of moving parts, um, you know, with the uh, coordinating with the school districts, RN coordinating with um, the, our participant group, um, ensuring everyone knows, you know, when the email is sent, what's in the email, all these things. And also for the, the experiment, um, making sure that um, we, uh, nothing gets, you know, contaminated. Um, uh, as, as best as you know, one can. So having open communication about that and knowing that you know, our, our colleagues in the School of Ed you know, trust the process um, with knowing that we are, are using this messaging and they'll continue their process because ultimately having you know, that RCT model will help us um, try to tease out what really works um, year over year. So that's what I'd add. I'll just add one more bullet point, Lee, um, thinking about the mission of Rockefeller. Um, in our case, it's very, very helpful for collaboration purposes to have someone in a leadership role, in our case, the PI, um, Bob Moret, who has a background in history in the intelligence community. So Bob was the former head of um, Naval Intelligence, also former head of National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, it's really hard to try to build a really durable and productive partnership with the IC if you don't have government folks who actually know how the community functions. So in our specific domain, our sort of federal sector, it really, really helped. And part of that collaboration included bringing students into the conversation, bringing interdisciplinary faculty into the conversation who really had no idea about what the IC was really doing other than, than news headlines. And with students in particular, especially diverse students, there were all, often, there are often negative assumptions about the IC in general. So we've really done a lot of mentoring and training to talk to students about the opportunities there and how they can make a contribution to public service through the IC. So I do have a question for Michelle from the Hopper. Um, so there, there are two questions. One is about the rationale for extending the application deadline. And the second is whether the School of Education had made any changes to their program to better respond to diversity needs. Um, and if the intent of recruitment matches sort of the, the intent of your recruitment materials match the, the program culture, 
um, and how that might affect enrollment and retention in the future. So I'll let you answer that live. Yeah, sure. Um, I did see that. I've been thinking about it. Um, these, these are um, really good questions. So the first um, rationale for extending the application deadline, I think, simply put, um, they wanted a larger applicant pool. I think that um, you know, and a, a dimension of this program is um, and something I didn't talk a lot about because it's um, not my expertise, but is the the school district side of this, and so. Um, while we are interested in getting people to apply in this first wave, um, ultimately we want there to be a good fit with the school district. And um, so on that end, um, we, the team is, you know, working to increase the number of school districts that we're working with. And in turn, that means we need a larger applicant pool for them to have the opportunity to see, um, you know, the talent that comes through and to see if there's a good fit for them. And so ultimately that means giving people a little bit more time to see if we can keep pushing people to apply. So that's the answer to that first one. Um, regarding changes to the program since we started this um, uh, recruitment effort. I do not believe there have been any changes. I do not think that they have changed the program based on what we've learned so far. I think they've, you know, the program was set and we're trying to, to, to the third question, you know, match um, what that pro program is envisioned to be. I think it's hard to know if we're gonna match the culture because the first cohort has yet to, um, materialize. <laughs> um, but I think that it's a valid point and that um, this is meant to or an element of, of reflecting, you know, what that program is, is, is. And um, I think it's something that we'll continue to, to improve on as we just get a better sense of um, who is available in the local region and, and with the partners that we've worked with to generate the sample that we've messaged. So. I'd like to extend a similar question to Corey and Michael specifically about, and, and you touched on this in your answer to the last question, specifically about how part of your pro, part of this collaboration is training the kinds of people needed by the federal intelligence community, but you also alluded to that this collaboration and talking to students is crucial to also understand what students need in order to take a job in the federal intelligence community. Could you talk a little bit more about how sort of those sides have together influenced how your programs have, you know, changed or how you've communicated student feedback to the agencies? Sure, um, and, and Mike can um, weigh in too, on, especially on the STEM side. I think one of the interesting things for us being part of this over time is to watch how the IC itself, especially in our communications with them, um, have grown as they get to know us and get to know our students and get to know our programming. I mean, we would joke um, when we first started this program that they had just a very kind of purist and maybe um, non-complicated idea of what the average you know, undergraduate in whatever field, because the program is open to any college, any discipline um, at SU and the consortia partners, they had a very sort of, um, I would say almost superficial idea of what students are like today. And they were very interested in um, numbers, you know, sort of baseline numbers, uh, diversity numbers, rather than understanding kind of the fulsome experiences um, and training. And, and potential expertise that students bring to the table. And so that was kind of interesting and in having to go back and forth with the IC a bit saying, why don't you try to redesign your, your data metrics for evaluating how we're doing on diversity in these ways that, that involve other factors than just kind of identity factors or whatever. And so that was kind of an interesting process. Um, on the student side, the conversations are really dialogue and ongoing. Why this is a potential interesting career for you, what you might be able to bring to this career, given your um, your expert, you know, your your growing expertise as an undergraduate student. Right, there's 
um, you know, you're, you're learning in these areas that encompass cross-cultural communication or even public relations or physics or, um, you know, um, you know, cyber security. The, the ways in which we had to help students sort of understand how their disciplinary major slash minor would fit into what the needs were of this very broad and diverse um, intelligence community was kind of part of the puzzle or part of the, the growth process. And just to add on, um, the value of a very motivated all-star student cannot be understated. Uh, when you have students that are uh, involved, uh, they help bridge those uh, gaps with other students and they help uh, show the, in this case, the intelligence community or the elements of the intelligence community, what the program that we have developed with their support has, has to offer. Uh, so, you know, having those students doing outreach uh, in addition to the faculty and the intelligence community uh, has been extremely, extremely beneficial. And I have to just mention, uh, because um, Bob Muret uh, uh, does preach this, the other thing is understanding that in the intelligence community, um, there's STEM, there are analysts, but there's also accountants and human resources. And those all have to be uh, you know, supported as well. So it's not just looking for those uh, uh, you know, future intelligence analysts, it's looking for all of the support uh, for uh, the agencies or elements. Well, I would like to thank all of our panelists once again. I think this was a really interesting and exciting session for looking at just the dynamics of job preparation and how important that is for understanding sort of the careers we're going to be seeing for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to stick around for the last panel of uh, the local government lab, which will be at 245. That is panel six, strategic visions, budgeting and planning for the future. Um, and welcome anyone to submit to next year's local government lab or attend any of our other super exciting events. Thank you again, panel, and we look forward to more of your research.